Shalom. The producer of our Jerusalem Lights Torah videos is currently in the IDF on military duty, fighting for the people of Israel. So I've been temporarily unable to produce our weekly lessons in our usual format, but I'm going to try and catch up with you today with the message as best as possible. I appreciate your understanding. Our Torah portion this week is Parshat Lech Lecha, the third Torah portion in the book of Rishit, beginning in Genesis chapter 12. In our portion, Abraham emerges one man all alone in the world to light a candle in the darkness, one man to single-handedly wage a campaign against the falsehood and hypocrisy of this world. Abraham's mission is going to be to spread the truth of the one God in this world, and the center for his operations and activities, the headquarters God instructs him, will be the land of Canaan. There, and only there, he will become a blessing to the whole world. God tells him in verse 2, you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and him who curses you, I will curse. And all of the families of the earth shall bless themselves by you. God promises this land to Abraham and to his descendants. Later, he clarifies in chapter 21 and verse 12 that only through the lineage of Isaac will offspring be considered to be yours. So we recall that it was just two weeks ago, believe it or not, when we began the yearly cycle of Torah readings once again, from the beginning, from Breshit, from the beginning of creation, and the world was created all over again, just as we all know that God renews and sustains creation each and every day. In the portion of Breshit, we saw the wonders of God's forming and fashioning every aspect of the created universe from nothingness with his word. It all began to unfold before us. We learned about the six days of creation and the Shabbat. We learned about Adam and Eve, the crown and purpose, the true purpose of creation. And we learned about their brief sojourn in the Garden of Eden and their exile and their subsequent reassignment. We learned about Cain and Abel, and all those early generations, those descendants of Adam and Eve. But by the time we reached the conclusion of Parshat Breshit, ten generations had passed, and God was, well, frankly, disappointed. Man was collectively using his gift of free choice for the pursuit of evil. Everything was falling apart. There was no semblance of morality left, no reverence for life. With the exception of the righteous Noah, Humanity had descended into an abyss of violent, depraved bloodlust, described in the beginning of the next portion of Noah with the words, Now the earth had become corrupt before God, and the earth had become filled with Hamas. And God saw the earth, and behold, it was corrupted, for all flesh had corrupted its way upon the earth. This concept of Hamas is a strong word that the Torah employs to convey the idea of a total breakdown of man's humanity to the extent that he no longer reflects the divine image at all, but becomes some sort of creature of darkness. And then, even after the earth's divine reset of the flood, generation after generation still chose evil over good, as exemplified by the builders of the Tower of Babel, who actually sought to rebel against God and unseat him, as it were. So this was the world that Abraham confronted. So as these Torah portions progress, our realization deepens that these are not simply stories, but it's the template of existence. And rather than wonder why is it that we reread the same portions every year, with each passing year, it becomes more and more clear that God is advancing our timeline towards his goal for creation. He is moving through history with the speed of the turn of a page. And these Torah portions tell us and prepare us. They tell us everything that we need to know. When we learn about God's disappointment with man, about how the earth began being filled with Hamas, about his decision to bring the great flood, and then about further manifestations of wickedness, we may be surprised to learn how badly human beings can mess up the world, bringing it to the very brink of destruction, just about from the beginning of time. And we may wonder, is all this exaggerated or far-fetched? Is it really possible that human beings can become so evil that they fill the world with Hamas? So flash forward 
to these past few days during which we have seen alleged human beings who no longer act with any semblance of human characteristics. While in its struggle to survive, it's Israel that's being judged for not acting in a humanitarian manner. So listen now. Israel's security forces are currently interrogating captured Hamas terrorists who participated in the October 7th massacre of 1,400 Jews. Clips released by the Israeli forces show terrorists describing orders to dismember victims and murder women and children. In one video released by the Israel Defense Forces, a terrorist stated that gunmen were given instructions to kill everyone they saw, including beheading victims and cutting off their legs. The terrorist testified, and I quote, The plan was to go from home to home, from room to room, to throw grenades and kill everyone, including women and children. Hamas ordered us to crush their heads and cut them off, to remove their hearts and liver, and to cut off their legs. He also said they were given permission to rape the corpse of a girl. An incentive was also given that those who bring hostages back will receive an apartment plus $10,000. Just yesterday, the military published a recording of a Hamas terrorist who took part in that October 7th massacre, bragging to his parents in Gaza that he'd slaughtered Jews. In the call, the man can be heard excitedly telling his parents that he is in the Falsim, a kibbutz near the Gaza border, and that he alone killed 10 Jews. Look how many I killed with my own hands. Your son killed Jews, he said. Mom, your son is a hero, he later adds. His parents, innocent citizens of Gaza, are heard praising him during the call. Identified by his father as Mahmoud, the terrorist says that he's calling his family from the phone of a Jewish woman that he's just murdered. I wish I was with you, the mother says. The audio was played at the UN Security Council by Israeli Foreign Minister Ali Cohen. So this week's Torah portion focuses on Abraham, now still called Avram, the father of the Jewish people. Chapter 14 of our Parsha opens with a strange account of a, a war of four kings against five who came from the north and east to the land of Canaan. I say it's a strange account because why is it recorded here? These were great powers, and this was ostensibly the First World War, and Avram was forced to enter into it because his nephew Lot had been kidnapped, and the patriarch set out to set him free. The deepest truth is that the war and the capture of Lot was but an elaborate subterfuge to lure Avram in, in order to kill him. That was the true goal, goal of this war all along. But here's the thing, so I'm going to be hard in the deepest way. In chapter 14 and verse 13 of our Parsha, Avraham is informed of Lot's capture, and in that verse, Avram is called Ha'ivri, translated usually as the Hebrew. Now, this word Ivri, Hebrew, appears numerous times throughout the Tanakh, and there are many examples. Here's just a few. Later on in Genesis, Joseph in Egypt is called a Hebrew lad, and he tells the chamberlain of the, of the cupbearers that he was kidnapped from the land of the Ivrim. And in the beginning of the book of Exodus, we meet the Hebrew midwives who explain to Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, that the Hebrew women are not like the Egyptian women. Joseph's brothers were called Hebrews. Moses was identified being of the Hebrew children, and he explained that the God of the Hebrews has called to us. The whole nation of Israel in Egypt were called Hebrews. And in the book of Samuel, the Philistines called the Israelites Hebrews. And on the ship to Tarshish, Jonah identifies as a Hebrew. So this is interesting because the word always seems to be used in the context of Israel's identity in the eyes of the nations. Yet the very first time the word appears in Torah is also the first time that it's applied to an individual. Here in our portion, Avram is the first individual who is called Ivri, and the word appears in connection with him only here, in the context of Lot's capture and Avraham's battle to rescue him. Why is that? Why is the word used specifically here? Now, this word Ivri is related to Ever, and it can simply be understood as referring to a, a descendant of Ever, as Avram was. As Shem is described back in chapter 10 and verse 21, the father of all the children of Ever. But from a lexicological standpoint, meaning the derivation of the word, it conveys the idea of a side, of one side. And Ivri, Ivri really means from the other side. So some interpret this word to mean from the other side of the river, as Rashi mentions. But just what is this side that the word represents? So open up your heart. Is this other sideness meant to be literal, or is it figurative? Midrash tells us that Avram was called Ivri because the whole world was on one side, and he was on the other side. So what does that even mean? 
So to illustrate what being on one side of the world means, another well-known Midrash tells us that already as a young man, Avraham took a bold and unprecedented stand for truth, and he was persecuted because of it. The wicked king Nimrod, who also appears in our Parsha in the guise of a king named Amraphel, he sentenced Avram to death on account of his belief in one God, and he decreed that Avram should be thrown into a fiery furnace, from which he emerged unharmed. So open up your heart deeper still. When Avraham went out to rescue Lot, he was taking a great risk. There would be those who would try to malign and vilify him. They would say that it was all Lot's fault that he was captured, that his capture was not born in a vacuum. They would even say that the whole war was Avram's fault and that he is clearly not a humanitarian but a racist since he's ready to kill so many people in order to free a member of his own family. What made the scenario even more fateful was the fact that Avram surely had to consider and weigh the possibility that these wrongful claims might distance people from his message, from the truth of the one God. And Avraham's life's work of spreading this knowledge might be negatively affected by the stand that he decided to take. But yet, nonetheless, despite these risks, Avraham indeed decided to venture forth to rescue Lot because Lot was righteous and the four kings were wicked, because Lot was the victim, because one is commanded to kill one who is coming to kill us. And it was this decision which demonstrated that Avraham was ready to stand against the entire world and to do the right thing, even if the whole world would cry that he's not a humanitarian. Thus, here of all places, and only here, the verse designates Avraham as Ivri, testifying to his stature, how he was ready to stand alone against the world, even in the face of the onslaught of the world's so-called morality. So now open up your heart deeper than ever before in your life. Avraham also faced the very real possibility, the danger that he would not win, that he would be killed in battle. And if that would happen, then there would be no one to call out in the name of the one true God and to teach others that he alone is God. So any normal, logical person would have advised him to stay home so as not to place his entire life's work in jeopardy. But still, he went out to save Lot, disregarding both the world's common conception of morality and conventional wisdom. He did this in favor of doing the right thing, and thus he is called Avraham the Ivri, the man who took a side. Israel didn't start this war. Israel was attacked, and a war was thrust upon her, a war of good against evil, a war between a civilization founded on divine principles designed for the betterment of humanity and the age-old evil that has and continues to threaten to engulf the world and destroy it. Hamas is a proxy of Iran, who also controls Hezbollah in Lebanon and militias in Syria and Iraq and Yemen. Iran is directing the efforts to wipe out Israel, along with civilization as you know it. Now imagine Iran succeeding in acquiring nuclear weapons. But Iran does not have a monopoly on evil, and this is not taking place only in our corner of the world. Go look out your window. It's on your doorstep. Which side are you on? Are you willing to risk it all by standing up for the truth of the one God of Israel in a world gone mad? Because wherever you are, none of this is far from you. None of this is irrelevant to you. Israel's struggle for survival is not only about Israel's struggle for survival. The leaders of the terror organizations have stated openly that the destruction of Israel is not the end game. The goal is world domination, and this will find you. But, Ein od Milvado. There is none but Hashem, and upon Him we rely. May He guide our people and all good people everywhere back to Him. May He protect and guide and strengthen our soldiers and lift their hearts with resolve to wage war against evil until it is utterly consumed. And by the way, since there are no coincidences, here's something to think about. According to the Hebrew calendar, which reckons the years from the creation of the world, this is the year 5784, and Abraham was born in the year 1948. And with Hashem's miraculous help, he, def he defeated the four kings and rescued his kidnapped nephew, and he was 75 years old at the time of that battle, just like the state of Israel. And the Hebrew year of that battle was 2023.